we're going to talk about something called the age of Metternich. Here's the terms. Go ahead and write them down and then listen for them. The Congress of Vienna was an attempt to restore the old order. It was an international conference that was called in order to remake Europe after the downfall of Napoleon I. And they met off and on from um, the fall of 1814 until the summer of 1815. It had been called by four of the great powers, Austria, Prussia, Russia, and Great Britain. And it was called to celebrate and confirm their victory over the fifth, France. A great power was a country that could shape international events. After nine years of almost constant war, the Allied powers had finally defeated Napoleon, exiling him to the island of Elba. Now, the victorious leaders gathered to restore the boundaries of Europe as they had existed before Napoleon's conquests. Um, as we know, Napoleon is going to escape. We're going to have the Battle of Waterloo, and then he'll finally be exiled again to St. Helena. And this last-ditch attempt on his part to regain power was really the nail in his coffin for the conservatives. It was just an example for them of why you don't want to give the common ordinary man power. And so you've got representatives from each of the countries coming to the Congress of Vienna, and each country has its own agenda. The result was skillful compromise. The moving force behind the Congress of Vienna was Prince Metternich. He was a very strong conservative. He was the host and the leader of the meetings. At these meetings, a lot of territorial decisions had to be made. And it was held in Vienna, Austria, thus the name, the Congress of Vienna. The main goal of the conference was to create a balance of power that would preserve the peace. Now, Prince Metternich was the most influential statesman of the time. He was Austria's foreign minister. And early in his career, he had linked himself to the Habsburgs, the ruling family of Austria. He rose rapidly through the diplomatic ranks. In 1809, when he was only 36, he became Austria's foreign minister. And he's going to hold that office for the next 39 years until 1848. Because of the huge influence he had on European politics, these years are often called the Age of Metternich. And that's 1809 when he came to power up till 1848. Metternich disliked and distrusted the democratic ideals of the French Revolution. Like most other European aristocrats, he was convinced that Napoleon's warlike dictatorship was the natural result of experiments with democracy. Metternich believed in the value of keeping things the way they were. He said, quote, the first and greatest concern for the immense majority of every nation is the stability of laws, never their change. He had three goals at the Congress of Vienna. He wanted to strengthen the countries that surrounded France to prevent future French aggression. He wanted to restore a balance of power so that no country was a threat to others. And he wanted to restore the royal families to the thrones they held before Napoleon's conquests. Because Austria, his country, was such a fractured zone compo um, composed of many ethnic groups, each loyal to their national heritage, Metternich wanted to make sure his country remained intact and that none of the revolutionary fever reached it. So how is he going to do that? Well, he felt that keeping a tight rein was the only way to prevent it. So, he used tight controls, strict censorship, 
a system of espionage and cooperation of allies. His ultimate goal was to protect and safeguard Austria by creating a system of European-wide repression. His ideas were a major force in European politics and diplomacy. He was the leading practitioner of conservatism. In fact, he implemented conservatism as a political and social reality. In the end, the Congress of Vienna was a clear victory for conservative forces. So who were these forces and what did they want? Conservatives included monarchs and members of their government, noble landowners and church leaders. They supported the political and social order that had come under attack during the French Revolution. They had benefited in many ways from the old order. So conservatives are the people who lost out as a result of the French Revolution. On the other hand, Conservative ideas also appealed to peasants who wanted to preserve the traditional ways. Well, the new status quo of the time came to be known as the Metternichian Order, and this title reflected his great influence. So, what were some of his beliefs and principles? First, there's his opposition to liberalism and nationalism. He regarded these as obstacles to peace, order, and stability. They threatened the conservative hierarchy of the empire. So here you see the Austrian Empire. And Metternich felt that liberalism and nationalism were very dangerous. They threatened to arouse all the minority groups within the empire. And this empire was sometimes known as the Habsburg Empire after the ruling dynasty. And at this time, this empire was a mix of ethnic groups. There were Slavs, Germans, Italians, Hungarians, Poles, Czechs, and so forth, all living within its boundaries. This is an empire that had been created through warfare and treaties. And so many of these people living within the empire were there because the land they're living on was carved away due to war, due to a treaty. Nationalism could be very dangerous in a situation like this. Here you see the distribution of languages during this period of time. Another one of Metternich's principles was dynastic legitimacy. This was the idea of returning to power those ruling families who had been deposed during the two decades of revolution and war the French Revolution, and the Napoleonic Wars. And then another principle was that there should be a balance of power within European affairs. No one state should be in a position to assert mastery over the continent. So who were the other major representatives? Well, from Great Britain, we have Lord Castlereagh. He arrives in Vienna wanting an easy settlement for France. He felt that France should have a moderate peace settlement with its previous boundaries. He was afraid that France would become unstable if they punished France excessively. Well, he gets to the conference, and he was won over by Metternich and ended up agreeing with all of his ideas. From Russia, we have Alexander I, the Russian Tsar. He had been a liberal when he came to the throne. He was actually open to change. But not long after he came to power, Napoleon invaded Russia. And so all those ideas about liberalism and change just went out the window. Because the Tsar saw what happened when revolutionary zeal ran crazy. And so he completely changed his opinions. And he arrives at the Congress Ab advocating the creation of a holy alliance run by Metternich's principles. And he also ends up agreeing with everything Metternich wants. From Prussia, we have Count Hardenberg, the Chancellor or Prime Minister. He was a liberal, 
and when he arrived at the Congress, everyone expected him to argue for liberal values. But he also came under Metternich's spell and ended up signing. The people at home, who were still liberal, were very angry. And then from France, we have Talleyrand. It was said that he had nine lives. He began his career as a bishop who sided with the Third Estate during the French Revolution. That got him excommunicated by the Pope. He wanted peace for France, though. While serving Napoleon, he tried to talk him out of invading. And at the Congress of Vienna, he was able to negotiate some fairly generous borders for France the same ones it had had in 1792. He also persuaded the Congress to restore the ruling family, the Bourbon family, to the throne. The Congress of Vienna settlement clearly reflected Metternich's aims. Several ruling families were restored to their thrones, for example, the Bourbon dynasty in France. This is the dynasty that had been overthrown in 1789, abolished in 1791, now they're back. Metternich came to realize that any possible balance of power in European affairs needed France. France's size and resources were important. So in the end, France was feated, treated fairly leniently. France lost its conquests its stolen artwork, things that Napoleon's army had, armies had taken. All the territory conquered by Napoleon was lost. But, rather than being saddled with a punitive peace settlement designed to punish them, France was gradually restored as a key member of the balance of power. There were other territorial compensations, too, for the other states. The victor states all enlarged their empires. Russia, for example, claimed Finland and part of Poland. Napoleon had l used Polish territories to mount his Russian invasions. So Russia wanted increased border security, and she got it with these territories. Britain got several islands, such as Gibraltar and Malta, ports and strategic bases. In Britain's case, it wasn't the size of the territories gained, but rather the strategic value. Prussia gained Germanic lands in the north and west along the Rhine River. Unfortunately, these territories were not united, and so actually ended up creating more problems for Prussia. One of the biggest winners, surprise, surprise, was Austria. Austria extended its control over northern Italy, especially the territories of Lombardy and Venetia. These were economically rich provinces. And control of these two provinces allowed Austria to control most of the Italian peninsula. The result is that the Italian peninsula was fragmented into numerous small kingdoms most of them owing their allegiance to Vienna. Austria also exerted control to the north over Germanic affairs. So, is the end result of the Congress of Vienna protection for Europe or repression? Well, a balance of power was created, a balance of power through shared territorial compensation. They all work together. Also, the peacemakers created a diplomatic alliance, the Concert of Europe. So what was the Concert of Europe? Well, it's a diplomatic alliance, as I said. It consisted of Britain, Russia, Prussia, and Austria. The diplomats at the Congress of Vienna failed to understand that repression alone would not do away with liberal and national ideas. They realized that a more permanent, regular alliance was needed to keep the peace. And so the result is the Concert of Europe. Its purpose was to keep the peace, to guarantee the new settlement, to maintain the status quo, to cooperate 
in order to maintain a balance of power and to spell out principles for international behavior. Metternich wanted the concert to crush liberal and national unrest wherever it reared its head. He wanted it to become a police force, even if it violated territorial sovereignty. Conservatism was very strong in Austria, and the concert had to deal with an entirely new movement, nationalism. So the way this worked was that if there was a problem somewhere in Europe, the various countries involved in the concert would send soldiers who would come work together to end the problem. I mentioned earlier that the Tsar of Russia, Alexander I, wanted to create a holy alliance. He does this. It consists of Russia, Prussia, and Austria. And you'll notice that these are the three countries that are still ruled by absolute monarchs. So these are the three countries who really have the most to lose by these new ideas. Then we have the Concert of Europe, also known as the Quadruple Alliance. And later on, France will be added. Metternich believed that repression was necessary to keep these ideas out. So, in 1819, the Carlsbad Decrees were issued. These were aimed mainly at the youth. They were Metternich's attempt to strengthen conservatism in Germanic lands. Metternich used these to stamp out liberalism in Germany. And they remind us of the power of ideas. Ideas like democracy and later on communism. Ideas which can blow away empires. So what do the decrees do? Well, they censor books, newspapers, musical scores. All of these things might contain political messages, which could be dangerous. They dismiss teachers and students from schools for promoting sedition or liberal ideas. There were police spies used for monitoring schools, notes, teachers, and so on. In 1825, Nicholas I reigned as Tsar as Russia. Um, the Tsar, his father, died. And actually, Nicholas's older brother was supposed to come to the throne. He didn't want to. And so, younger brother Nicholas ends up becoming Tsar. However, there was a short period of time when no one was on the throne while they were trying to decide what to do. And during that time, the Russian officers saw an opportunity and they revolted. They wanted a constitutional government. Well, this revolt began to spread. And Nicholas comes to the throne. This revolt's ongoing and he's terrified. He's lost power. So he uses military force to put down this liberal movement. But the movement spreads and it spreads. And it spreads beyond the boundaries of actual Russia. Um, by 1830, there's an uprising in Warsaw, Poland. And so he calls in the Concert of Europe to put it down. The Concert of Europe used force on two other occasions. When a liberal uprising arose in Spain, France was authorized to use force to, send, um, to end it. And when there was a similar problem on the Italian peninsula, Austria was authorized to use the concert to put it down. And an interesting fact about Nicholas, when he came to power, he was actually pretty liberal. Um, he was open to change. And then the revolt occurs, and he saw the danger of losing control, and he completely changed his views. He became ultra, ultra conservative. In fact, he was known as the gendarme of Europe, the policeman of Europe, because of his rigid ways. What happens, though, is that there comes to be a growing disagreement within the concert system over how to use it. Austria, Prussia, and Russia had the most to lose. These are all unreformed countries, still ruled by absolute monarchs. They're still the old regime. 
They want to use the concert system as a police force to crush any unrest which, which threatens to go in the direction of liberalism. Britain, however, opposed this idea. They wanted the concert to guard against foreign aggression. The balance of power, they thought, should be used to prevent another Napoleon from gaining mastery. In the end, the Congress of Vienna was a political triumph in many ways. Its settlements were fair enough that no country was left bearing a grudge. So the Congress did not sow the seeds of future wars. And in that sense, it was more successful than many other peace meetings in history. Not until 1853 were any of the five great powers involved in wars against one another. And not until 1914 did another major war occur. The Congress of Vienna was a victory for conservatives. Kings and princes were restored in country after country in keeping with Metternich's goals. But there were important differences from one country to another. Britain was the only country of the great powers with a gr uh, true constitutional monarchy. Parliament, though, actually had far more power than the ruler. But Britain was really far from a democracy. Most members of Parliament were wealthy landowners. They were elected by a tiny fraction of the population. Only men who owned a substantial amount of property were qualified to vote. But Britain's form of government was still much more open than anything found in Eastern Europe. Generally speaking, governments were more conservative in Eastern Europe than they were in Western Europe. The rulers of Russia, Prussia, and Austria were all absolute monarchs. Late in 1815, the rulers of these countries drew up an agreement, and this is that holy alliance I mentioned, where they promised to help one another if any of them were threatened by reformers or revolutionaries. Now, among the great powers, France's position was unique. The old Bourbon dynasty ruled once again, but an elected chamber of deputies shared some power with the new king, Louis XVIII. This parliament was even less democratic than Britain's. Only about one in every 300 French men, and no women at all, had the right to vote. France, after 1815, was deeply divided politically. Conservatives were happy with the Bourbon Restoration and determined to make it last. Liberals wanted the king to share more power with the Chamber of Deputies and to grant the middle class the right to vote. A lot of people in the lower class, especially in Paris, remained committed to the ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity. They were determined to overthrow the Bourbons and make France a republic once again. So it's an explosive mixture of ideas and factions that will contribute directly to revolutions in 1830 and again in 1848. So what else did Metternich do? Well, an organization known as the Germanic Confederation was formed. This was a loosely organized political union of all German states, including Austria. Metternich's Austria had supremacy and called all the shots. Metternich made sure that Austria would remain the leading power in German and Italian affairs. He wanted to stop the spread of liberalism and nationalism. Unfortunately, we're going to see a gradual breakdown of the concert of Europe. The gradual breakdown of the concert represented a victory for forces of political change. Liberalism and nationalism were already on the march. The first major defeat for Metternich was the Greek War of Independence. Um, the Greeks had been overtaken and ruled by the Ottoman Turks, and in 1829 they rise up against them, fighting for their independence. And this was considered to be a very romantic revolution, and people from outside of Greece came to help. One of those was Lord Byron, the British poet. He was involved in this. In the end, 
the Greeks won and their independence inspired others. In 1830, the July Revolution in Paris occurred. This replaced Parliament and a reactionary king who tried to suspend liberties. The new French king agreed to abide by a constitutional system. This revolution inspired an uprising in Belgium in 1830. Belgium won its independence from the Dutch. So what we start to see happening is a tug of war between liberalism and nationalism on the one hand and conservatism on the other, which will eventually explode. Prince Metternich had warned of a revolutionary seed. This refers to the ideas spread by the French Revolution and Napoleon Bonaparte. He believed those ideas threatened Europe's monarchs. He believed they undermined the basic social values of society. Here's what he said. He said, quote, Kings have to calculate the chances of their very existence in the immediate future. Passions are let loose and joined together to overthrow everything that society respects as the basis of its existence. Religion, public morality, laws, customs, rights and duties, all are attacked, confounded, overthrown, or called into question. So basically he's saying that if these ideas spread, they're going to make people think. And if people think, they're going to question the way things are. Well, at the Congress of Vienna, the European powers had tried to uproot that revolutionary seed. Other voices, though, kept challenging the order imposed in 1815. The clash of people with opposing beliefs, systems of belief, ideologies, plunged Europe into a period of turmoil that's going to last for more than 30 years.